we begin our worship of God, we do so with a question. On this glorious Sunday morning, what are some of the things you're thankful for? Sunshine, weather, beach, church family, church family, new hip, friends, a new hip. What else? Selling your house. Selling your house. Selling your house. Baptism. Baptism. Music. Temperature. Temperature. No rain. Calm. No rain. We are so blessed, way beyond measure. Friends, with a sense of gratitude for the gift of life, for many, many blessings. Together, let us worship God. May we begin with a prayer. Lord, for this day, for the gift of life, and for many, many blessings, sunshine and friends and music, in the gift of life, we give you thanks. We pray that in the moments before us that you will bless us with a sense of openness to sense the spirit in the midst of us, to let the word and the tune and the waves and just the sense of grace in this sacred place carry us through this service and this day and in the week that is before us. For these things we humbly thank you for and ask in your name. Amen. Amen.
to say hi, so please go ahead and take a moment to do that. Sunday morning, and we especially thank all of you who are guests or, or visitors or with us for the first time. If you want to leave your name and email address on the table where those two gentlemen are waving at us right now, Charlie, that uh, would and uh, that would allow us the opportunity to send some stuff your way, to tell you about what we have going on in the, the weeks ahead, including a, a um, big picnic the end of this month, the last Sunday of this month. So, um, thank you for joining us. I want to say thank you to Elliot Delman and Phil Goldman for being here. They uh, are part of the Dancing Bohemian Ukulele team, but they also evidently play other instruments and uh, quite well. And so, gentlemen, thank you for the Brazilian music uh, correct that you provide today uh, here on the beach and uh, there's lots of good things going on uh, in the church in the weeks ahead and so uh, keep an eye on your newsletter I want to say uh, thank you uh, Meg Barnhart for treats which have been pretty uh, nice to consume yes. and if you'd like to uh, provide treats one of these Sundays uh, you can talk to Pam, who's raising her hand right now. Just look for a woman in a blue hat. <laughs> and the odds are that will be Pam. And uh, Or you can sign up over on the table by where the guys are. Now, uh, Zach, anything you want to say about uh, cool stuff? I just want to say one thing. We have a community garden going in cooperation with Lake Forest College. And 100% of the produce we produce from that garden goes to people who need it. So we would love to have your participation. We still need to put the plants in the ground. The ground's ready to go. And then we'll have ongoing uh, duties and chores out there. If you'd like to be involved in that in any way, uh, come see me. You'll see it in the newsletter, uh, probably almost weekly in the summer. But come see me and we can talk about how you can connect. Thank you. We, uh, we have the privilege now of offering the sacrament uh, of baptism to a little angel. And, uh, you know, most of us are worried about, you know, what's happening today and, you know, what does the future look like, et cetera, et cetera. What's amazing about this sacrament uh, is that uh, it's probably been offered somewhere in the world uh, each and every day for the last 2,000 years. And most of the time, or much of the time, it's on a body of water just like this, not in a chalice or, or a baptismal font inside a church. And so we have the privilege, privilege of offering that sacrament. And uh, so I'm going to go step into the body of water. <laughs> and uh, you need to do that, but if you'd like to come to the edge uh, of the water, please do so now. <laughs> Friends, may we please begin with a word of prayer. Lord, on this glorious day, we again give you thanks for the gift of life. We know that you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. And we pray that you will nourish and sustain this child throughout all days. Words which come to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Here are the words of Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. This is the full Christian name of this child. Not the Son. Amen. 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 Please have a seat. Thank you. 
my great grandmother, Ruth Jessamine Irish, was nicknamed Clancy by her husband, the name she went by her whole adult life. Because, like the Bing Crosby song, Clancy could and did on more than one occasion lower the boom. And yet, she was also the most dignified and eloquent woman that her family and the people that knew her knew. As a young woman, Clancy waitressed at a restaurant in Riverton, Wyoming in the summertime. And one day while waiting tables, Clancy was getting harassed by a patron. Finally, the man went too far and pinched her on the derriere. And let's just say Clancy didn't warm to the move. When she came back with the man's food, a plate of meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and gravy, she said, here's your plate of food, and dumped it in his lap. She was fired, but not before delivering a bit of righteous justice. This uh, is one of many stories told about my venerated great-grandmother, the first stories we hear as children are often family stories, the stories that pass on the traits and values of a family to the next generation. And depending on how we're raised, a second source of significant story in our lives might be Holy Scripture. The stories we tell and the stories we hear are important to who each of us becomes. The scripture for today, Psalm 97, is included in the common lectionary for today, the seventh Sunday of Easter. It goes like this. The Most High reigns. Let earth exult. Let the many coastlands be glad, including the North Shore. Cloud and dense fog are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of her throne. Fire goes before him and consumes adversaries on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. Mountains melt like wax before the master of all the earth. The heavens proclaim justice and righteousness, and all the people see God's glory. All those who make their boast in worthless idols surely one day have a rude awakening. They've put their trust in a mirage and will one day be compelled to comply with the way of justice. Zion hears and is glad, and the villages of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O oh God, for you are most high, the highest power over all the earth and the universe. You who love God despise evil and risk your life to oppose it at every turn. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in God, O oh you righteous, and acclaim his holy name. In the stories of Scripture, we're told that righteousness and justice come with a wide possibility of expression. It comes with evil being challenged and ultimately vanquished. And it comes in tender moments of healing and forgiveness. The other night when I was putting Henry to bed, after teeth had been brushed, books had been read, and all the other bedtime rituals were finished, Henry and I were laying there in the quiet moments before sleep, and he whispered to me, who is that good guy? That really good guy? I was pretty sure who he meant. 
Who do you mean, I said. You know, the best guy. <laughs> the best guy, eh? I said, waited, waiting for him to find the name he was searching for. After a few long moments, he said, Jesus, tell me a Jesus story. Oh, you want a Jesus story? Those are pretty good stories, aren't they? <laughs> and I told Henry the first Jesus story that popped to mind. The blind man received sight. Jesus made mud, combining spit and dust, and rubs it in this guy's eyes. And tells the man to go away and wash his eyes. Right? And the story, as I'm telling it, just sounded crazy. And I'm thinking, well, I wonder what Henry's thinking about this. <laughs> Spitting in the dirt and making mud and putting it in somebody's eyes. And this skepticism is exactly what the story explores after the healing. How absurd and unbelievable it seems that a man was healed of blindness. This kind of thing was unheard of, and the religious leaders were squawking. They weren't happy about it. Uh, and they tried to humiliate the man who was healed. But he went undeterred because his sight had been restored, and so he wasn't too worried about the religious fuss going on around him. But Jesus used the occasion to teach about who he was. You can find this story in the Gospel of John, chapters 9 through 10. It's a story worth reading and telling and retelling. The stories we tell and hear are vital in making us who we are as individuals, as families, as communities. So what stories are we telling? I heard a life-changing caliber story the other day on, of all places, a cycling podcast. The story was about the Italian cycling champion Gino Bartali. Has anybody heard of Gino Bartali? Yes. Got a couple? Good. From the first, From the first sermon. <laughs> Tom, too. Yeah. So we've got, we've got two legitimates and uh, two uh, fakers. And then Lydia heard it as I prepared. I believe this guy, Gino Bartali. Well, here's his story. Nicknamed Gino the Pious. He, uh, and in Italian, uh, so great. Italians are so stylish. Gino Taccio. That's Gino the you, you can correct my Italian later. Um, because he was a devout Catholic. You probably, most of all, we know. There's two of you that really know who this guy is. You've never heard of him, and neither had I, until about a week ago. Uh, and he was featured in the podcast because the tour of Italy uh, ends today in Verona after three weeks of racing. And it's the second biggest cycling race behind the Tour de France, Gino won Tour of Italy twice and the Tour de France twice in 1938 and 1948. In 1938, after Gino had won, Mussolini lightly or heavily suggested that he dedicate his victory to Mussolini and the fascist regime, and Gino declined, which sounds sort of you know, benign, except for it was with great risk that you, that you decline Mussolini's invitation. Uh, but greater uh, risks were to come, not only for Gino, but he had a wife and children. Uh, being a cycling champion is what made Gino great, but it's not what made him righteous. Gino uh, was a citizen of Italy, and Italy had become a refuge country for many Jews fleeing Germany and other countries in the north. When Mussolini was ousted, the Germans entered more heavily into Italy and immediately began rounding up the Jews and sending them to the concentration camps. Cardinal Florence the Archbishop Costa, Cardinal, the Cardinal of Florence, where Gino was from, 
uh, Archbishop Costa, knowing that Bartali was a devout Catholic, asked him to join an underground network offering protection and safe passage uh, for thousands of Jews and other endangered people that were concentrated in Assisi. And Bartali's role was customized to his talents as a cycling champion. He became a bicycle courier between Florence and Assisi. Uh, on the face of it, he was taking long training rides um, for which he was known. But in reality, he was carrying photographs and counterfeit identities uh, to and from a secret printing press, all hidden in the frame and handlebars of his bicycle, and wearing his racing jersey emblazoned with his name uh, that gave him a degree of respect and untouchability. No one wanted to touch the great Bartoli to the public outcry. Uh, he, he was, though, on more than one occasion, brought in for questioning. In addition to smuggling photographs and documents, Bartley hid his Jewish friend and neighbor, Giacomo Goldenberg, and his family in the family cellar, uh, risking his life and his family's life. In 2010, Gino Bartali, who never spoke of what he did, was posthumously awarded Israel's highest honorific for a non-Jew, righteous among the nations, bestowed on those who risked their lives during the Holocaust to save Jews from extermination camps. Gino's son remembers his father's words in regards to his efforts. He said, you must do good, but you must not talk about it. If you talk about it, Taking advantage of others' misfortunes for your own gain. And then he said my favorite line, certain medals hang on the soul, not on the jacket. We tell and retell stories of righteousness, not to be entertained, but to be inspired by the brave and the pious so that when our opportunity comes, and it will, to act with righteousness, uh, we can do so, and we will do so. In job-risking ways, perhaps, like correcting the misdeeds of a misbehaving restaurant patron, as Clancy did with a plate of meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and gravy. Or in life-risking ways, like Bartali did, helping save countless people from the Holocaust. And let it be remembered in the quiet recesses of our hearts that certain metals hang on the soul that cannot be affixed to the jacket. Amen. Tom. Um. One uh, very brief additional story, since Zach's talking about stories. Uh, it's true, and it's the kind of role that I sometimes play with him as Zach's older brother, and that's to remind him that the moments that he's in, like the one he had with Henry, that is so precious to cherish those. When you're laying in bed with your little guy, he's out there with a hat on right now. Um, Dad, tell me a story about Jesus. I mean, that, that's got to be a greatest hit of being a dad um, doesn't exactly stay like that forever. <laughs> Maybe it does for you all, but not for this guy. So very briefly, uh, like the conversation some of you have had with your children, what we said to Tommy when he was 16, he just graduated from college, when he was 16, we said, you know what, son, if you're ever in an awkward situation, you're in a difficult place. You can call your mom or me, and we will come get you. No questions asked, period. We'll extract you from whatever place you don't want to be. So about halfway through his sophomore, junior year, I can't remember, Saturday night, about 
we get the phone call. Dad, can you come get me? Yeah, where are you? I'm in Deerfield. Okay, yeah, no problem. So we get the address, put it in the phone, figure out how to get there. Gene and I hop in the truck. We're like, oh my gosh, what could it be? And what's he doing in Deerfield? We zip over there, we pull up in front of the house. I text him, Tommy, we're here. About 90 seconds later, he comes out, walks out, gets in the back seat of the truck. We drive away. Tommy, you all right? Yeah. And we're trying to keep this covenant that we're not going to press it, you know, on what was going on. We get about halfway back to Lake Forest. So, like, man, what's up? He goes, well, I was with, and then he named six buddies, and they all go to this other church. He goes, we were, like, having fun, and we were playing cards, but we went over to this other guy's house, and pretty soon, it's Saturday night at 9.30, and we're, wa we're watching an Old Testament video on Moses and talking about that. And I'm like, wait, that's what we extracted you from? The preacher's kid is stuck watching an Old Testament video. It's like, Dad, get me out of here. Rescue me. So enjoy those precious moments. Zach, while they last... Please know that we are very grateful for the support you provide the community church. Gentlemen. Stories. And 
and hearing stories, and so go now uh, into the rest of today, into this week, into the weeks ahead, and tell stories, and retell stories uh, that are stories of significance, and help spread uh, love and righteousness, and sow little seeds of righteousness so that they can grow up for all the world to enjoy, and in doing so, uh, medals will be hung on the soul that cannot be hung on the jacket. And the people said, Amen. Amen.